Thank you. Hi, everyone. Everybody still awake? More or less, yeah. OK, let's see. This is a bit of a theoretical topic, so let's see how dry it will be. So I assume that everybody has an idea what Elasticsearch is, right? Uh, so we don't need to cover like shards and indices and stuff like that, and you know what nodes are. So we'll just build on top of that. Otherwise, shout if anything is missing. So I work for Elastic, the company behind the entire stack. My official role is developer advocate, so I mostly travel around and show what we're changing or what we're trying to build. And that's pretty much my role definition. So let's see what we have. So what is, what is it even when I say cluster coordination? What, what are you expecting when I say cluster coordination? A any expectations what might be cluster coordination in Elasticsearch? Yeah, so you have different node types that you want to get to, yes. Um, the general idea is you want to have something we call the cluster state. So the cluster coordination takes care of the cluster state. Now, obviously, the next question is, what is the cluster state? And that is exactly when you have different nodes. But it's not just the different nodes. It's much more than that. Um, so what you have is you have cluster-wide settings. You have index metadata. So cluster-wide settings might be like, these are all the nodes that make up my cluster. Could be a single node, could be three nodes, could be 200 nodes, whatever you have there. You could have index metadata that might be, for example, you have one index that is the specific mapping for that. Those are the settings for that index and the mapping settings that you have in those. You could also have additional information, like, for example, the index is broken up into one or more shards. On which nodes are these shards? Are there replicas of that shard in sync with the primary shard? And all of that information, that is the cluster state. So that is basically the meta information that keeps your cluster alive and keeps everything working, and lots of other different pieces. This is not about the, the data you keep in your cluster itself. This is just the metadata to keep your cluster operational. Um, you can check what you have in there with underscore cluster state. And you can only see what is kind of like the metadata you have in there. Important is, if you lose data there, in our opinion, it's much worse than losing a single document. Because losing a single document, you have one document that is gone. Losing an entire shard or the mapping for some uh, index is much worse than that. And that might have or might impact lots of documents and not just a single one. So for us, the cluster state is the thing that needs to be in a good state and only moving forward. If you ever lose any cluster updates, it's also a very bad day for your cluster. Um, that is kind of the important part. So we want to keep that data in a good shape and only moving forward. Um, one example here, this is normally very long. For example, you can see I have version 29 of a cluster I've just started up, which is my Docker cluster, which I have ru running locally here, but that would contain a lot of other information. So it would know all the indices I have in there, the mappings of those indices, like which version of which mapping I have, and all those pieces of information. That is the cluster state that I have in there. Now, the three main components of that entire discovery, um, or that kind of entire cluster state is, you have discovery, which are the other nodes in my cluster, what can form one cluster. You have the master election, like which single node is the master and keeps track of that state, and that is the only one who can write to that cluster state. And the publication of the cluster state in the end to actually spread out the current cluster state to all the other nodes in your cluster. Um, so we've used something called Zen for a long time. If it was always so Zen, we could discuss. Um, the general idea is we have Zen to do the discovery and the election. And we've recently, for version 7, rewritten that to Zen 2. However, we don't really emphasize Zen as a name that much anymore because it's not pluggable. As soon as you have Elasticsearch, you have Zen 2 nowadays doing everything for cluster coordination for you. You cannot throw in anything else. That is intentional. Uh, we don't plan to have any alternatives to that. So you're stuck with that. That's why we generally don't emphasize Zen that much, but this is the thing or implementation that we have in there. And the general idea is that Zen is pretty much like whatever is happening in your cluster, your master should be pretty stable, like sitting in the middle, and whatever happens around it doesn't affect its state so much. That is the general idea of having this Zen idea. Maybe in the past it wasn't always that Zen, but the, the idea is to have it more Zen in the future. Um, why? We have this resiliency page in Elasticsearch, uh, which documents all the things that could go wrong, um, either in practice or in theory, in your cluster. 
And one very important point that we had on there that we were recently able to strike off because of this rewrite of Zen um, was that if you have repeated, the repeated is important, repeated network partitions, uh, you could lose cluster state updates, which was a very bad day for the cluster if that happened. It was kind of complicated to trigger because it had to be repeated in a specific order and timing window, but it could happen. And then you would lose important information. And that was one part of that cluster uh, re or the Zen rewrite that we did. It was also because Zen initially was kind of like a bit homegrown and it was just put together and then patched up over time to just work better and better and we like experimented like these are the right timeouts here, we know that these are the kind of right settings in combination, these normally work, but it wasn't really proven or as theoretically founded uh, and grounded as you would want. So the general idea was we want to redo this to fix issues like this one. And basically we, st we started with Elasticsearch formal models, which is another public repository we have. And this started with a theoretical specification in TLA+, and we also have model checking for that in TLC. Um, I have managed to stay away from those uh, specifications, um, and I don't really know what they're doing, uh, but it might look something like this. And if this is your thing, you might have a great day diving into those. Um, I, I'm fine and believe my colleagues who work on that, um, that they can prove that the cluster state is going right from one good state to another good state and we don't have any anomalies like on a theoretical level and then can prove that our algorithms that we build on top of those also do the right thing. So discovery is generally we have these three things and the first thing was uh, the discovery. Um, where are my master eligible nodes? Um, is there a master already? This is kind of like the part of discovery. Um, Basically, the idea is if you have three nodes, they should all come to the same conclusion what your cluster looks like. Um, because right now you can see the three nodes all have a different opinion of what the cluster might look like. You have like the one in the bottom left thinks there are only two nodes. Uh, the one on the bottom right thinks there are actually four nodes, which probably don't exist here. But the idea is to have one uniform version of what the cluster looks like and what you have in your system. Um, previously, you had the following settings or actually First, you have the old settings, and in 7, we have these new settings. The old ones still work, they're deprecated, but they will be removed in the next major version. So what used to be um, Zen ping unicast hosts is now just called discovery seed hosts. Since I said Zen is not pluggable, we just threw it out of the API um, because, well, you cannot change it anyway. You will always have Zen in there anyway. So by discovery seed hosts, you basically provide the host names of all the hosts um, or some of the seed hosts that can start forming your cluster initially. Um, if you have a more dynamic environment like a cloud provider, you could provide either a file or some specific tagging, firewall group, whatever, in from your cloud provider that the nodes find each other and then form a cluster. So you don't have to know the DNS names or IP addresses in that setting. You could just provide another mean to find the right nodes. Or if you have a more static setting, you could just provide the seed host, which is like a set of starting nodes. Don't have to be all of them. But one node needs to reach at least one of the other seed nodes, and then they will form one large cluster overall. Um, the master election that happens once the nodes have found each other will then be like, who should be master? And then they will form a cluster. And unless something goes terribly wrong, there will always be exactly one master node in an Elasticsearch cluster. And ideally, you form that pretty quickly because you cannot run any major updates uh, while you don't have a cluster. Um, or you cannot write, do any changes actually at all. Um, so the general idea is you have that leader and everybody else is following that master node. Um, to whatever next state or step you want to take. That's the general idea when you have the master. So what you did have is, and for some, the resolution here is not what it should be, but it's called discovery send minimum master nodes, um, which Simon mentioned in his talk earlier, is something you always use to set. If you didn't set that, you would have a cluster that probably would be in a very bad state. Um, the problem is it has to be set manually. And the first thing is, do you trust your users always to set that correctly? Um, as we have learned, you probably should not, because people will often set it incorrectly or not set it at all. And the other problem is that if you have changed the num number of master eligible nodes, you might also run into trouble. Because what this might look like is, 
Let's say we have a three node cluster and you, st you start those three nodes up. And right now there is no cluster, there are just three independent nodes. And let's say we didn't set minimum master nodes. And then you could, can see like they could form three independent clusters um, by the different colors. Like each one of them could think, well, I'm the only node, I will start my own cluster. And there is no way to reconcile that afterwards. So you cannot easily merge the data together if you have independent masters and they diverge. So that's not a state we want to have. What you would always need to do is the majority of three is obviously two. So you would need to set it to two. You, so you could have these two nodes could form a cluster or these two nodes and well, there would be a third combination um, with a combination of two or all of the nodes together form one cluster. So that's good, that works. The problem is what happens if you want to scale that cluster up? So let's say we keep the minimum master nodes too, but we want to add one more master eligible node. What could then happen is that suddenly you add that other node and then you have two clusters again. Because you satisfy that condition, the minimum master nodes, you have two here, you have two there, but you have two independent clusters in the end. So this is not very healthy. Um, the other thing is if you want to scale down and you have a single node and you set minimum master nodes to two, well, you couldn't elect the master so your cluster wouldn't do anything. Um, so these situations were kind of tricky to always like scale the, the master eligible nodes and that setting correctly on all the nodes that proved to be tricky and people would just set it incorrectly and that was the number one source for issues and data loss in Elasticsearch in general. So the idea is probably to automate that and make that setting go away so people don't have to set it or have the, the possibility to set it incorrectly. Um, so what we have now is initial master nodes. Um, which is basically the list for the very first election. So the bootstrap process when the cluster comes up the very first time, that setting is being used. And after that, only the cluster itself will keep track of what are the master eligible nodes and it will automatically set the number of minimum master nodes basically internally. You cannot set that explicitly anymore and you don't have to. So this is only for the very first bootstrapping approach. Even when you do a full cluster restart and you have an existing data directory, we will keep that information there. So this is really just when forming the cluster for the very first time. Um, then this initial master nodes uh, list will be used. Um, it is okay to set this on multiple nodes as long as they are all consistent. What you shouldn't do is you shouldn't set like one node as the minimum initial master nodes on one node and three on another like the list of those hosts, because that would not be easy to like, find a conclusion to that. Uh, if you set it on more than one node, uh, it needs to be in a consistent state. Um, once a cluster or a node joins a cluster, even if it's just being restarted, that setting will be ignored. So it's just for the very first time you start it up. Um, you don't have to set that when a node joins an existing cluster. It would just be ignored. So you don't have to set that afterwards anymore. Um, when you upgrade from version 6 to 7 and you do a full cluster restart, then you have to set that. If you do a rolling upgrade, you don't have to set that because you still have the minimum master nodes from before. You're just joining uh, and then the new nodes in 7 would figure out like, okay, these were the right settings in the past and I know how the cluster should look like, so I know what the minimum master nodes basically are. There is no need to set that explicitly anymore because the cluster will know on its own. Um, if you start a cluster fresh and you did not set cluster initial master nodes and you have three nodes, what you will get is you will get an error um, or actually um, it will get a warn message. The cluster would not form, but it would continuously log that message. And it is actually helpful with that new message because that contains quite a bit of debugging information. So this is the first page of three. So you can see here, I'm logging that I have a three node Elasticsearch cluster, which my cluster is called Docker cluster, and I'm on the Elasticsearch 2 node here. And this one give me, will give me continuously messages telling me what is wrong. And you can see here, um, master not discovered yet, um, and this node has not previously joined the bootstrap cluster, and it would basically say like, hey, I'm master eligible, and I have found these other two nodes. So it has found an Elasticsearch uh, 1 and Elasticsearch 3 node, those three together well, they had, don't have the initial master nodes set, um, but they found each other, but they cannot form a cluster because they don't know maybe there should be three more 
or maybe there should be two more. They don't really know how much there should be in total uh, because you haven't applied that right setting for the very first time you start them up. Um, and then you would also get some more uh, information that it will tell you. Um, it will try to continue discovering. Like the current node is the Elasticsearch 2 that is running this here. Um, and it will also tell you this was the last cluster state that I knew. Um, since this is just right from the startup, none of these values have, any, have been ever set. So the cluster has never formed and just didn't form correctly. Um, if you want to scale a cluster dynamically, once it has formed correctly, if you j add any nodes that are not master eligible, nothing changes. Everything is like before. If you add a mas master eligible node, just do it. Because the cluster will then figure out, oh, there's another master eligible node. Do I need to change how many nodes I need to have to actually have the master selection and have the uh, majority? Um, the cluster will figure that out automatically. You can also remove master eligible nodes. The only thing you cannot do is do not remove more than half of the master eligible nodes at once. Otherwise, the cluster will not be happy because suddenly it lost the majority and it would not form, know how to form a cluster anymore. Um, the cluster state publication is basically the last step once you have formed the cluster. That is pretty much like the master node does the right operation. It tries to apply it to the majority of the master eligible nodes. Only then it can be sure that the majority has it. Um, and if, even if the master dies, like another node will have that state. And then it will actually broadcast the updates, which looks pretty much like this. So you have, um, this is our master eligible node, this line here. You get a change, for example, you add an index or you add a node, and then you basically try to publish that event to the majority of the nodes. So for example, the master has it and one of the other nodes has it. So then we have two of the three nodes have that state. Then you have published it successfully, and then you can commit it. So then the master commits it to both of the other nodes, and then they apply it. And that's how you uh, publish the cluster state or an update to the cluster state. Only the master node can actually change the cluster state. I will first apply it to get to the majority of nodes, and then once it has the majority, it will actually commit that change. And that is how that publication works. And in generally, the cluster looks something like this. You have the master, and it will just have a peer-to-peer -peer connection to all the other nodes and broadcast to them what is happening in the cluster. Um, to wrap up, normally I would try or give you a demo with a rolling upgrade and failure states and everything, but 20 minutes is qu not quite enough to do that. Um, I, ha I will publish the slides afterwards. Basically, what you have here is I have my three Docker containers in a rolling upgrade scenario. These two here, the Zen, Zen, Ping, Unicast, these were the old settings, these two here. These you can remove, and these are the new settings. And you can see the seed host is kind of like a direct translation from this one. And instead of saying minimum master nodes is two, you basically provide the list of these are the three nodes that are master eligible, and they form the master eligible status in the end. OK. Zen to Zen 2, generally faster. The elections will be much faster, it's safer, and it should also be more debuggable because the debugging output is better. Otherwise, you should not really notice. And except for some bad configurations, we haven't really seen much trouble in the discuss forums. Um, by the way, if you don't have enough of Elasticsearch yet today, we'll have a meetup tonight. So if you want drinks and more discussions, um, come to Kamunda at 7 PM, where we'll have the meetup and have some more Elasticsearch talks. Um, that's it. Do we have time for questions? Yes, like two minutes. OK. Any questions? Um, how do you discriminate between uh, a dying node and a node that you just remove? So suppose that I remove a master node. Um, well, so what we have is we have these health checks, which are basically pings, um, which Every x seconds, I forgot which, how, how many seconds, five or something like that, we ping a node. And once it's not reachable, like I think if we pay, fail three pings or something like that, don't, maybe those numbers are wrong, but it's something like that, then we'll just assume the node is dead. We cannot determine if it has really been removed um, or if it's just like stuck in a long garbage collection, for example, or if the network is down. But then it will just be removed from the cluster. And later on, if it comes back, it can rejoin the cluster. But we don't really make that differentiation if it has been explicitly removed um, or not. What you could do is, if you know you want to rotate out the node, you could, for example, vacate the allocation and move all the data that you have on that node, if it's a data node, 
um, to other nodes and then remove it more gracefully that you don't really have like data being impacted by that. What I basically meant is uh, when you remove a master node, um, the cluster rebalances and ah, yeah. so uh, internally does its state, pro state processing. If it's the actual master that you remove, then the other nodes keep pinging that one as well, and then we'll figure out, okay, the master is not reachable anymore, um, and then they will check, like, hey, do we have enough master eligible nodes to actually form a new cluster? And then they will hold an election and form a new ma or an, and elect a new master. And that is now much faster because we were able, previously we had like some tweaks around the timeouts. Uh, with the new protocol, that is much quicker that we figure out, oh, the master is not there and we don't have to wait until everybody has waited. So this is much quicker. But generally, everybody is pinging everybody else. And when, when the node is not reachable, it will just be removed. And if it was the master node, we will hold an election and actually elect another master. If you have enough master eligible nodes left. Because if you have, for example, three master eligible nodes and two disappear, the remaining one cannot vote because it might just be a network petition and the other two might be somewhere else. So you need to have the majority still to be able to do that. That's why you cannot remove the majority of master eligible nodes at once because otherwise the cluster would just not be able to elect a new master. Make sense? Yes, come to me later. Um, since we are completely out of time, we'll take one more question. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned debuggability, and um, I'm also got a question regarding the Zen pings. Um, is there any way that, because Elasticsearch is, is quite sensitive to network issues, um, to introspect the latency of the pings, or if there's like a ongoing issue, is there a way to like introspect this? So I think generally the, the error messages that you run into have changed quite a bit and should give you much more information than before. I haven't recently tried out like how the timeout message looks like, but I think normally it's very verbose and will tell you like, hey, this was not reachable and this is how many times it failed and this is the, the time it took. So that should generally be more debuggable than before. Um, yeah, so the, the idea was also to make the entire thing more debuggable um, than before because sometimes it was a bit hard to see. And as long as people provide like the full stack traces uh, or the full error messages, we were in the discuss forums pretty quick to actually debug what was going on. The main problem is if we don't have like all the outputs, then it's sometimes a bit hard to know what is really happening. Uh, but given the full outputs recently from what I've seen, uh, debugging improved quite a bit. Cool, thanks a lot. <laughs>